President Johnson, the month of November began with the arrival of King Mahendra of Nepal. Reigning over a real-life Shangri-La, locked for centuries in the remote mountain fastness on the roof of the Himalayas, the King of Nepal only recently opened his doors to the rest of the world. And he has equally thrown wide the doors of opportunity for all of his people. It is a new Nepal that he sees and that he seeks to build. We Americans share his vision and we share his hopes. We know it's hard for a nation to be torn from the cocoon of the past, to be catapulted forward almost overnight into the 20th century. But we also know from 15 years of partnership and progress that the people of Nepal will triumph in their struggle. That advance does not end at your own borders. Nepal has carried its good influence and its example into the great forums of the world. You help all nations to advance by making clear what you cherish most and want most to see all men cherish. If America shares Nepal's hopes and visions, it is because she herself was once locked behind closed doors, denied her freedom, isolated in the remote fastness of a new world. And like Nepal, the America of today finds that her advances do not end at her own borders. Having thrown wide the doors of opportunity to her own people, she now carries her influence and example into the great forums of the world. Throughout November, President Johnson would repeatedly remind his countrymen how far America had come during her brief moment in history. At the same time, he would caution that these accomplishments were things of the past, to be accepted and preserved. The important problems lie ahead. America's unprecedented strides in education, health, and productivity, to be truly meaningful, must be shared with nations less fortunate, and in so doing arrive at a true international partnership for the common betterment of the world community. One of his emissaries, Dr. James Killian, returned from Latin America to report on the vigorous use of science and technology to speed economic and social development. Dr. Killian is serving at the request of President Johnson with the group of experts convened by the presidents of the American states who met at Punta del Este in April. Dr. Killian figured prominently in another milestone of progress early in November. As chairman of the Carnegie Commission, he had proposed that the airwaves belong to the people, a proposal that now becomes law with President Johnson's signature on the Public Broadcasting Act. The act establishes a new institution that will assist stations and producers who aim for the best in broadcasting, who seek, through television, to enlighten their audience. President Johnson applied America's academic and technological resources to a host of specific problems around the world. To the rectors of the five universities of South Vietnam, he expressed hope that the best of the Vietnamese teachers could reach all of the country's students through the modern miracle of public television. This theme of international partnership was again in evidence with the arrival of the Crown Prince of Laos. In extending America's hand of friendship, the president spoke of the achievements that would be possible if nations could only work together. I spoke of the blessings that would flow to millions if we could together harness the wild Mekong. This mighty waterway, longer than the Mississippi River in our own country, is the real life stream of Southeast Asia. Its waters have the power to build peaceful and prosperous nations in that area of the world. With the arrival of the Prime Minister of Japan, frank views were exchanged on the entire gamut of international concerns common to both countries. They sought ways to reverse the trend in the race between world population and world food supply by hastening the day when developing nations could stand on their own feet. They pledged close cooperation in the expansion of world trade. They sought peace and security in the Far East, recognizing that this goal depends not only upon military strength, 
but political stability and economic development. I think the objectives of the American people and the Japanese people are very much the same. First of all, we want peace in all the world, and particularly in that troubled part of the world uh, uh, where we do not have it now. We want uh, education for our children, health uh, for our people, a small amount of uh, uh, recreation that can make us enjoy the good things of life. And together, by working closely together, we have moved uh, in that direction. Few international gestures have more solid substance than the transfer of territory. During their talks, President Johnson initiated the immediate arrangements for the return of the Bonin Islands to Japan. This gesture not only strengthened the ties of friendship, but reinforced the conviction of the Japanese people that the administrative rights of the Ryukyu Islands may one day be solved within a similar framework of mutual trust. Influence, to be effective on an international scale, must be backed up with example at home. Creating a new city government for the nation's capital, a government responsive to its people's needs, had long been a dream of President Johnson. Much of that dream turned into reality with the swearing in of the district's newly appointed city council. I want to say to the congressman, and both the House and the Senate, as I said last night, let's don't treat the nation's capital as a stepchild. Let's try to make it a model child. Let's try to let it be the city that every other city in the world would like to copy. But get out there on those streets and talk to those people in their homes and in their businesses and see what's in their heart and in their head and what they need and how we can best supply it. And let's try to unite this city into a drive that will ultimately give us a national capital of which we can be proud. Thank you very much. In another ceremony in the East Room, President Johnson honored two women in uniform for bravery and outstanding service in Vietnam. To Air Force Nurse Colonel Ethel Hofley, the Legion of Merit. To Army Nurse Major Marie Rogers, the Bronze Star. The president took this occasion to end a long-standing inequity in the armed forces. In signing the Equal Promotion Opportunity Bill, he gave to women the same chance for military achievement traditionally enjoyed by only the men. He commended the female leaders and doers, and as he handed out the customary pens to his distinguished guests, he discovered that he had one left over. He soon remedied that, however, when he suddenly spotted a well-known leader and doer on the sidelines. On the 8th of November, Vice President Humphrey reported to the President on his 11-day tour of Malaysia, Indonesia, and Vietnam. The President asked Mr. Humphrey to brief a joint meeting of the Cabinet and the National Security Council. Also invited, the Congressional leadership on both sides of the aisle. And the one outstanding thing, and the most important of all, that I know will give all of you great pride, was his observation that the military leaders in that area, the best men that we have been able to produce, feel that we have never had a better trained or better equipped fighting force. And we've never had better morale found anywhere in the uniform of the United States than in those men and women who are holding high our flag in Vietnam today. It was Veterans Day weekend. Starting in Fort Benning, Georgia, 
the president carried the admiration and gratitude of his people to the men and women of the armed forces. And for these Americans, Vietnam is no academic question. It is not a topic for cocktail parties or office arguments or debate from the comfort of some distant sideline. These Americans here do not live on the sideline. Their lives are tied by flesh and blood to Vietnam. Talk does not come cheap for them. The cost of duty is too cruel. The price of patriotism comes too high. Across the breadth of the land, virtually racing the sun across the sky. By noon, he was in company with the Marine Corps at El Toro and Camp Pendleton. Freedom has never come to any people as a gift. It has never been held by any people who were not able and willing to defend it. The Marine Corps does defend it. The Corps was born as a commitment to freedom, and it has honored that commitment every single hour of its existence. It honors it today. And thank God. Even as the president watched the planes of the Enterprise demonstrate their fighting proficiency, he pressed the search for peace, seeking out a neutral corner somewhere in the world where men might reason together. The United States follows the dream of peace, so we include even the seas in our search. For us, the ward room could easily be a conference room. A neutral ship on a neutral sea would be as good a meeting place as any. So long as two would come to the meeting, so long as both met halfway, so long as one did not insist that the other walk on water and work a miracle alone. After spending a night at sea aboard the nuclear carrier Enterprise, the president worked his way back across the country, saluting the men of the Air Force at both McConnell and Langley. Our spear is sharp, our cause is just, and it is backed by strength, your strength. Our cause will succeed. The president ended his journey at the Coast Guard Station in Yorktown, Virginia. It was here in 1781, out of the fires of the last crucial battle, that a young nation asserted her independence once and for all. And now, almost 200 years later, the same spirit prevails as American men in uniform help another young republic assert and defend her own independence half a world away. After a two-day cross-country tour explaining his administration's policies in Vietnam and defining America's responsibilities abroad, President Johnson relaxed for a few moments in Williamsburg, Virginia. 
The president and his family have attended church regularly, visiting throughout the land, many houses of worship, the big and the small. However, no service had ever been so publicized as this one on November 12th, Bruton Parish, Williamsburg. Seeking spiritual solace, the president instead received a sermon on Vietnam, questioning America's purpose in Southeast Asia. If there were moments of discomfort, they were not in evidence. The president thanked the rector and Mrs. Johnson complimented the choir. The rest of the day was spent with family and friends against a backdrop of autumn color in the historic countryside and town of Williamsburg. Perhaps he found spiritual solace after all. For here in this tidewater area, as far back as the early 17th century, were planted the seeds of self-government, the respect for human dignity, the belief in individual rights. America's future leaders learned how to make and to enforce the law. When freedom was threatened, they learned how to preserve it. With his weekend of rest with family and friends behind him, the president again went into the ring and took on the big events. First on schedule, a six-month report from Ambassador Bunker. Returning from Vietnam for a regular consultation visit, the ambassador gave President Johnson an overall view of the situation in Vietnam. Not only have the national elections been significant, but the elections also for the, at the village and hamlet level because this marks the beginning of the reinstitution of local government, which was pretty well wiped out by the French occupation and by Zim. This, I think, can have an extremely important effect in the country and in the countryside in involving the people in their own development, their own well-being. More briefings from Vietnam. Arriving for a one-week stay at the White House, General Westmoreland reported to the President. Out of the myriad war charts, intelligence reports, and meticulously gathered statistics, emerged a pattern of progress. Slow, to be sure, but steady, tangible, promising. Mr. President, in view of your talks this week with General Westmoreland, Ambassador Bunker, and others, what is your present assessment of our progress and prospects in Vietnam. First, I think every American heart should swell with pride at the competence and capacity of our leadership in Vietnam. I believe, and our allied people believe, that we have a superior leadership, and I think it's the best that the United States of America can produce in experience, in judgment, in training, in general competence. I have spent, uh, I've had three meetings with Ambassador Bunker and three with General Westmoreland. I had coffee with him at length this morning, just before I came here. 
our American people like when we get in a contest of any kind, whether it's in a, a war or an election or in a football game or what it is, they want it decided and decided quickly and uh, get in or get out, and they like for that curve to rise like this, and they like for the opposition to go down like this. Now, that, that's not the kind of war we're fighting in Vietnam. Uh, we uh, made our statement to the world of what we would do if we had communist aggression in that part of the world in 1954. We said we would stand with those people in the face of common danger. And the time came when we had to put up or shut up. And we put up, and we're there. And uh, we don't march out and have a big battle each day uh, in a guerrilla war. It's a new kind of war for us, so it doesn't move that fast. I think we're moving more like this. And I think they're moving more like this, instead of straight up and straight down. We are making progress. We are pleased with the results that we're getting. We are uh, inflicting greater losses than we're taking. We are very pleased with the, amidst uh, the horrors of war, and more people have been killed trying to vote in South Vietnam than have been killed by bombs in North Vietnam, according to North Vietnam's own figures. But in the midst of all the horrors of war and guerrilla fighting in South Vietnam, we have had five elections in a period of a little over 14 months. And to think that here in the midst of war, when the grenades are popping like firecrackers all around you, uh, that uh, two-thirds or three-fourths of the people would register and go vote and have five elections in 13 months, and through the democratic process select a, a, a people at the local level, a constituent assembly, a House of Representatives, a Senate president, and a vice president, that is encouraging. We have a lot to do yet. A great many mistakes have been made. We take two steps forward and we slip back one. It's not all uh, 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 perfect by any means. There are a good many days when we get a C minus instead of an A plus, but overall, we are making progress. We're satisfied with that progress. Our allies are pleased with that progress. And every country that I know in that area that is familiar with what's happening thinks it's absolutely essential that Uncle Sam keep her word and stay there until we can find an honorable peace. And uh, if they have any doubts about it, Mr. Ho Chi Minh, who reads our papers and who listens to our radio and looks at our television, if he has any doubts about it, I want to disillusion him this morning because we keep our commitments. Our people are going to support the men that are there, and the men there are going to bring us an honorable peace. One of those men, Staff Sergeant Charles Morris, was awarded the Medal of Honor in a White House ceremony. It was a double honor for Sergeant Morris, for his field commander was also present. I recall, Mr. President, when you honored us by coming to Cameron Bay to see the troops on the battlefield in South Vietnam, I told you while trooping the line that never in all history had a commander in chief commanded finer troops than are now commanded by President Johnson around the world, but particularly in accordance with my personal knowledge on the battlefield in South Vietnam. This American fighting man is represented today by Sergeant Morris. As the final days of November ticked off, President Johnson faced an array of major problems, tackling each with a seemingly endless reservoir of decisiveness, energy, strength. On November 18th, grim news from Great Britain. Having worked hard over a number of years to correct its trade deficit, the government of the United Kingdom announced its decision to devaluate the power value of the pound. Determined to keep the international monetary system strong, President Johnson reaffirmed the American commitment to buy and sell gold at the existing price of $35 an ounce. 
From the Eastern Mediterranean, new tension, this time focused on the island of Cyprus. The president would once more call upon his international troubleshooter, Cyrus Vance, to act as America's man on the scene. On November 22nd, Vance, as special emissary of the president, would fly to Ankara and then to Athens to help remove the danger of war from that troubled part of the world. To a nation's surprise, his valued Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, would seek a new post, having been nominated as the new director of the World Bank. McNamara was unique among defense secretaries, having held the office longer than any of his predecessors, able to see military issues in a broad context. Above all, even as keeper of the nation's sabers, he remained a humanist. In November, President Johnson signed into law the National Commission on Product Safety. Although a major bill in its own right, it signaled more than protection for the consumer. For Lyndon Johnson, it virtually marked the end of his first four years in office. For the nation, it meant another milestone in a long line of impressive legislative achievements that met the urgent priorities of the 1960s. In translating legislation into a program of action for the American people, no president could match his record. We need to crack down on the con man, the gyp who prey on the aged and who prey on the defenseless. Some of our parents save up all their lives to buy a little home for retirement. But then some swindler comes along and gets hold of them, and they wind up in a useless swamp with a piece of no good land, or they wind up in a worthless shack. No administration ever worked harder nor more aggressively in using the federal machinery to help its people, particularly in those areas where human needs were the strongest. As President Johnson wound up his first four years of office, the nation saw the completion of 80 months of continued prosperity and economic expansion. The gross national product for the first time in history topped the 800 billion mark, and to cap it off, the 200 millionth American was born. All in all, November had been a milestone month, but the true meaning of the month would not be found in America's power nor prosperity. It would be revealed in how she used her success in helping others. We see a nation that having begun its own climb up the mountain has neither forgotten nor has it forsaken those people throughout the world who want to grow and who want to prosper in their own ways. We see a nation that's catapulted to world leadership, a nation that has exercised leadership without thought of conquest or without thought of enrichment, but with only the thought to establish a free and a stable world for ourselves and for other human beings who live in that world. To put it in a sentence, we have success in America beyond all of our wildest dreams. And we owe it to ourselves, I think, to note and to remember that as we welcome this 200 million American into our midst on the eve of our third century as a nation, that if we only congratulate ourselves on what we've done, we will really miss its meaning, which was that for 200 years, our people constantly said, make this nation better work for the future. Don't quit until the doors are open to everybody. <laughs>